No matter how much time I put into this engineering firm I was working at, no matter how much hard work I did, you can't really climb the ladder in corporate America and keep up with inflation and, and do better. Seemingly, on paper, I guess it looks like you're doing better, but knowing that inflation is actually higher than what's reported, I, I've quickly found out this is not the, like the path for me. If we're agreeing that CPI is incorrect, inflation is actually more like, let's say minimum 10%. That means if I'm getting 6% for my big raise and then a year later, another one and a half percent, it's still not keeping up with inflation. Going to 2020 to 2021, I kind of knew it was going to happen. I knew the price was going to run up. And I, I felt myself not living in the moment. I was always looking to the future. When's the price of Bitcoin going to go up? What is this going to do for me? How is this going to help me financially? How is this going to help my family? But I forgot to stop and smell the roses. If Bitcoin's a 5, 10, 15, 20 year investment, I sh shouldn't really care that much about price action. Um, and I should focus more on, on my family. And, and friends and cultivating my life and living the life I want to live. If you're planning too much in the future, looking towards the future and, and not, not remembering to look around where you're at right now at this moment, you're gonna forget and you're gonna let that time go by. And before you know it, years and years will go by and okay, so you have, you have 10, 20, 30 Bitcoin. Uh, you have plenty of savings, retirement, great. But do you have a family that loves you? If you enjoyed this podcast and you want to learn more about Bitcoin, then make sure to subscribe to our free newsletter. Every Friday, we send out insights into macro, Bitcoin on-chain, and Bitcoin mining. Join over 100,000 existing subscribers by clicking the link in the description or going to newsletter.blockwareintelligence.com. You wouldn't walk down the street with a giant sign that has your home address on it. So why would you do the same on the internet? You need to use a VPN. Orca VPN is a service that encrypts your internet connection and hides your IP address, ensuring your online activities are private and secure. Orca VPN works on all different devices, Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, and Linux. Head to orcavpn.co and use the code BLOCKWARE and you can access Orca VPN for just $1.99 a month. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, you can ensure that all your internet activity is private and secure. Again, that's orcavpn.co, O-R-C-A-V-P-N dot C-O. This video is sponsored by Stamp Seed. You plan on holding your Bitcoin for decades, so you need to make sure that your seed phrase is documented in something that can last just as long. Stamp Seed's signature titanium plates and stamping kits do just that. If you simply write your Bitcoin seed phrase down on a piece of paper, it's vulnerable to fire, water, and all sorts of erosion that can happen over time. Make sure you keep it secure for years to come. Head to stampseed.com and use the code BLOCKWARE15 for 15% off the entire website. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the BLOCKWARE podcast. I'm proud to welcome Eric Podwajski. Eric, welcome. Mitch, thanks for having me. Yeah, so we, uh, we got to meet each other at Pacific Bitcoin, and we unfortunately got waxed in the basketball tournament, but I had a good time anyways. It was, it was fun playing with you. Yeah, remind me, like, don't get me wrong, basketball tournaments at a Bitcoin conference sounds like a good idea, but playing in it and then going to try to network and talk to people after is not the best idea when you're all sweaty. So maybe I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take a seat for next year. Yeah, I was very gross and nasty. And then, then like an hour later, I had to roll with Ben Askren. So I'm kind of glad we lost because I didn't really feel like playing anymore anyways. Yeah, yeah. I know it stinks to lose though, but oh well. Yeah, next time maybe the court won't be so slick. I, that hurt my uh, my skill sets based on agility. Not to make excuses, but the, the slick court definitely didn't excuses. play well for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're running Bitcoin Talent Co. And that's really exciting. I want to get into that. But I think a good starter question would be you know what's your background right i i see you tweet a lot about how you used to work a fiat job and you hated it so i assume that's part of why you started bitcoin talent co so can you yeah. explain your your career story you know where where'd you go to school and then what were you doing before you got into bitcoin sure and just so the audience knows uh, i co-founded bitcoin talent co we're the first recruiting firm dedicated to working with bitcoin focused companies um so before i got there i actually wasn't in recruiting uh, I went to school at Penn State University for energy engineering uh, and minored in environmental engineering. So I thought after school I was going to come out and maybe work in like renewable energy, something like solar. I uh, couldn't find a job right away, so it took me a couple months. And I actually landed a job in the uh, oil and natural gas space. 
I was working as design engineer there, managing man hundreds of product uh, projects across Maryland, Vir- Virginia, DC. It was a lot to be honest for for someone straight out of school. Uh, but I learned a ton of project management skills and and managing people skills because we had drafters under us. Um, so worked my way through the ranks there, and then after a couple of years, I realized that the the raise I was getting every two years. So they give you like every year they give you like a one point five percent two percent raise to mm-hmm. do with inflation. Um, and then every two years or so you, you get a, an upgrade to your, your next job title. So as I was going from a design engineer to a senior design engineer, I realized that the, it was like six, seven, eight percent, something like that. The raise they're offering me was still not enough to keep up with inflation. So just to do quick math. I mean, if inflation, if we're agreeing that CPI is incorrect, inflation is actually like more like, let's say minimum 10%. That means if I'm getting 6% for my big raise and then a year later, another 1.5%, it's still not keeping up with inflation. And then like, in my mind, I was like, I'm never going to get ahead in life. No matter how much time I put into this, uh, this engineering firm I was working at, no matter how much hard work I did, you can't really climb the ladder in corporate America and keep up with inflation and, and do better. I mean, seemingly on paper, I guess it looks like you're doing better, but knowing that inflation is actually higher than what's reported... Um, I, I quickly found out this is not the, like the path for me. Mm-hmm. So I quit one day and I decided to go full time into Bitcoin. I mean, not going to lie every day during my, my fiat job, I would check the price of Bitcoin. I was on Bitcoin Twitter. I was just so interested in every day. I became more interested in it. So I said, screw it. Um, I'm going to change my career from engineering. I'm going to do some more, more business type of stuff in the Bitcoin space. And that was about three years ago now. And I've been full time in the Bitcoin space since working at Bitcoin Magazine, and then yeah, co-founding Bitcoin Talent Co. Now, that's really exciting, dude. That's such a good point about the raises not keeping up with inflation, and it kind of punishes loyalty, right? If you stayed with that same business for 10, 20, 30 years, you're just gonna get hammered. And a trend I've noticed along uh, amongst my peers and folks a little bit older than me, maybe closer to your age, millennial types, is they they hop from job to job, like every two, three years. And Mm. I I never thought about it until now, but I guess part of that is just because you do get those bigger pay increases by simply changing jobs. That's that's exactly why. I think when it comes down to if you want any significant raise nowadays, you have to change jobs entirely, change companies. Yeah, that's that's an interesting uh, knock-on effect of fiat that I hadn't considered. Uh So let's dive into the Bitcoin Talent Co. Because I guess there's two ways if you want a Bitcoin job, right? You can go out and find one, work for a company. You work for Bitcoin Magazine for a little bit. Or you can start your own company. So Mm -hmm. why did you want to start Bitcoin Talent Co.? You know, what was the niche you were seeking to fill? And then who else uh, co-founded it with you? Sure, yeah. Well, working at Bitcoin Magazine, uh, they have a very big media presence. And then I realized there was an opportunity to start growing my own presence online, which I did. I just took a, a writing course and just started posting every day. And yeah, since that, that happened like a, a year ago or so, maybe less. And since then, I've grown my, my following to close to 13,000 followers on Twitter. And the reason I bring that up is because doing that brought opportunities my way. So while I'm working at Bitcoin Magazine, I'm posting about Bitcoin content in general. And I started getting into a little bit like about like job related content um, just because I saw no one was really talking about it. So I started filling that void, uh, carved out my little niche. And then eventually my co-founder, Andy, shout out Andy, uh, he reached out to me cold on Twitter and LinkedIn. He said, I have this idea for a, for a Bitcoin recruiting firm. Um, now in my mind, I was thinking of ways to like monetize job seekers, but he had it flipped. He wanted to monetize companies to mm. pay for, to, to get uh, new employees. Um, and he's had an, a, a prior background doing so. I mean, he had his own recruiting firm. In Silicon Valley, uh, he's, he was like an early empl- employer at Uber. So he was the guy to do it. If I was going to join anyone to create a recruiting firm, it'd be this guy. And then lastly, our, our third co-founder, Michael Tanguma, um, he's worked uh, various tech companies at Google, WeWork, um, Un- Unchained Capital. And now he's the CEO of OnRamp. So, I mean, yeah, it was like uh, a team of three, really. And we all brought a different skill sets together. And we just, yeah, we realized this is the time. Uh, to do so, to build this company, because now there's there's money in the ecosystem, in the Bitcoin only ecosystem, for companies to hire. So I think yeah, this is just perfect timing now. Yeah, I agree. Especially going into the bull market, I think gone are the days of a VC raising money for like 
shitcoin pump and dumps and yeah. they're going to start wanting to raise money for Bitcoin companies. Yeah, you're seeing it happen right now. I mean, I know Unchained Alone has deployed over $100 million in Bitcoin companies and Bitcoin only companies. Uh, there's several other ones and they keep growing by the day. Yeah, it's an interesting approach to to take it from the side of the employer, right? Because when you're a Bitcoin company, you don't really want to hire non-Bitcoiners. Mm -hmm. And so the way I'm thinking about it, I guess is you guys function as that filter. It's like, you know what a Bitcoiner is. You know what these companies are looking for in mm -hmm. terms of personality type and maybe skill set based on the certain job description. So you can really filter out, you know, and give them a solid list of candidates to choose from. Yeah, I mean, just to, when you're starting out a, a job search as a company, you're getting inbound hundreds and hundreds of applications. So that can take uh, hours on hours to do that alone, just filter through those applications. Even just that first round check is like, is this person a Bitcoiner? Do, do they have the experience or background for this role? I mean, that's, that's a very hard lift in the beginning, especially if you don't have any like processes set up. If you're a Bitcoin startup, new to hiring, um, that could take a ton of time off your plate. So that's where we come in exactly. We, we, we do that first uh, filter screen. And then after that, we, we send the, the qualified ones to the, the hiring manager. And then from there, we, yeah, we help through the rest, rest of the hiring process as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Because if you're already, you know, in a startup, we're wearing lots of hats, right? So you don't necessarily have time to also be like a full-time recruiter if you're trying to expand. So yeah, I definitely exactly. think you guys are filling a, a solid niche. What demographic of people are you seeing get hired right now? Is it all across the spectrum? And, and you mm -hmm. know, what kind of background are these companies looking for? Yeah, so while we're recording this, we are in the depths of the bear market, maybe coming out a little bit now. But considering the bear market, that means money's tight and mm -hmm. Bitcoin companies don't have uh, a lot of capital to spend on hiring new employees. So we have what we saw in like 2020, 2021 is companies hired like crazy. They scaled up like crazy and then they had to lay people off like crazy, too. Um, so I'm expecting that's probably going to happen over this next year as the price of Bitcoin goes up again. But for right now in the bear market, and we launched less than a year ago, what we're seeing is mostly sales and, and engineering type of roles. And we're seeing mostly like, I'd say mid-level to senior. So anywhere, mm -hmm. anyone between like late twenties, all the way up to early forties or so. That's, that's the bulk of the hiring we've done so far. We did run an internship program this summer. We had hired a couple people in college or just fresh out of college. So there's a handful there, but for the bear market, I'd say right now, it's more of that mid-level to, to senior level type positions. Yeah, that makes sense. This is the time where you definitely want to lock in on, on like who's going to lead your company going into the next bull market. Right. I think every company that's right now you... knows the bull market's coming, knows demand's going to get crazy. So it, yeah, it's, it's getting your leadership team in place now. So you're ready. Yeah. What kind of companies are hiring right now then? Because you say it's not a lot. So I'm curious to see, you know, who's able to expand during the bear market and then sort of a follow up to that because you interact with so many different companies. Where do you see the biggest opportunities in Bitcoin? Like what type of business do you think is going to be the most successful going forward? Yeah, I'd say whoever's hiring now has money. Uh, a lot of it is VC money too. So you'll see announcement come out. Uh, companies raise maybe six figures, even seven figures for initial seed round. So those are ideal for us. And then on top of that, what's most ideal, I'd say, the most opportunities if you're, if you're considering a, a recruiting firm would be looking at companies going from maybe the seed stage to series A or so, or maybe even series B, because that means they're mm -hmm. ready to scale. So for us, it's like, how can we get embedded with a company that doesn't have an HR team yet, but they're ready to scale and we can take on 20, 30 roles at one time. Um, that's how I, I think bulk of the business is done. Right now, it's a lot of one-off roles because yeah, capital's tight. So companies are very conscious about who they're hiring, which roles they're hiring for, and we're just filling in those one-off, two-off roles here and there right now. Yeah, that, that niche makes sense, targeting the... Uh seed round to series a that makes a lot of sense because once they get beyond that they may have their own hr team and yeah too. exactly and i have yeah. one more thing to add too in terms of opportunities we're seeing um expanding outside of just small bitcoin only startups um i mean we're happy to support them but if if not enough demands right there right right now we have to branch out a little bit maybe the institutions think about non-endemic bitcoin companies hiring for bitcoin related positions like let's take mm -hmm. shell for for an example right energy company and they just started getting into Bitcoin mining. So they're going to be hiring a handful of Bitcoin related positions. So how do we get embedded with them, help those find those right people? That would be a good fit 
to bridge the gap between their their non endemic uh, company and Bitcoin. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. It reminds me of the Michael Saylor quote, where in the '90s and 2000s, every company had to become an internet company, and now every company is going to have to become a Bitcoin company. So there, yeah. everyone's going to need some sort of Bitcoiner. And I was actually, so I recorded with Peter Dunworth earlier today, and we talked about how Bitcoin knowledge is kind of a monetizable skill set, especially mm. going forward, because it is so niche, right? And if we're right that Bitcoin's going to in, ingrain itself in every aspect of the financial system, yeah. every business is going to be touching it. Not a lot of people really understand how it works on a technical level and you know what you need to do as a company to really interface with that. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on you know Bitcoin knowledge as a a skill set and then building off of that idea that you just mentioned where various non Bitcoin companies are going to need to bring in Bitcoiners. Yeah, I think the skill set is very important. I think uh, if you're listening to this, you're probably, I'd say, more of a Bitcoiner yourself. You have that deep knowledge, even though you might not, uh, your, your task wasn't to go and get a job, but you just have it anyway. I would say up to this point, the last couple of years, Bitcoin knowledge itself could honestly get you a job. You can see that with like Bitcoin Magazine. That's that's the bulk of their hiring um, strategy. To hire Bitcoiners because they'll get, they'll go above and beyond just because they they're so passionate about it. Um, but I think now competition is getting steeper as more people come into the space. There's tons and tons of people that have that have spent a thousand hours listening to Bitcoin podcasts, read all the big books. Um, so now you have to pair that knowledge with a skill set. But if you're someone that has the Bitcoin knowledge and you also have a specific skill set. Um, that's, that's in demand, could be marketing, could be finance, really, really anything in a typical company. Pairing those two together is very valuable. Um, and you can market yourself very well in the, in the Bitcoin, uh, ecosystem. Yeah, that I tend to agree with that on that, which leads very well into my next point, which is Bitcoin content creation, right? So Mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter how much, you know, if you're not able to share what you know with the world. And you mentioned this earlier, you you spent time growing your platform. So can you talk a little bit more about making Bitcoin content? What, what can you do to stand out? Because I do feel like there's a lot of people trying to make Bitcoin content and not everyone really has the keys there. Yeah. So I think I got into Bitcoin like late 2017. Um, and I was just a consumer for probably three, four years or so. And consumers basically just, uh, not putting anything out and you're just reading and taking all the time. But I think half learning process is distilling what you've read and putting it on paper uh, or talking about it on a podcast. Uh, if, you, if you can't explain it to someone, that means you don't really understand it. So mm-hmm. once that, that light bulb went off my head, plus I also realized that I think it's like 95% of internet users are consumers and 5% actually post. And of that 5%, maybe 1% only posts like meaningfully like every day or like have some kind of strategy trying to build a following. Mm -hmm. Um, Knowing that those two things together, I was like, you know what, let me start posting my, my Bitcoin knowledge online for my own selfish reasons to get to make sure I'm actually understanding this content, but also to to grow a following, to bring opportunities my way. Um, So that's exactly what I did. I, like a year ago, I started posting consistently on Twitter. Um, I started a podcast through our, our company. It's the Bitcoin talent Co podcast just put out one a week. I also write a Bitcoin newsletter. So I curate the the most uh, up-to-date news, I guess, every every week or so on the Bitcoin ecosystem. So that could be like Bitcoin company updates. <clears throat> um, it could be the, the best podcast that came out the last two weeks or so. Yeah, just mm-hmm. a couple of high level. Um, what, could, what could we learn about the Bitcoin news? And what that's done personally for me, it's solidified my own understanding. So now I'm on top of the market all the time. And if I have conversations with someone, I could say I could recall things that happened recently in the industry. I connect the dots. So in a weird way, Bitcoin content creation is very selfish because it, it helps you, I'd say, the most. But at the same yeah. time, the, the second order effects is building your own following. Uh, yeah, it's it's been great so far. So I'd highly recommend that to anyone. And then in terms of job seekers... It's one of the best things you could do. If you're creating content online um, or have some kind of online presence in a network, that automatically, I guess, raises you up in the in the Bitcoin competition ladder for, for a certain job, right? If I'm looking at someone that posts zero content online um, and someone that posts every day and has a large network, that other person is probably going to get, the, the ladder's probably going to get hired um, mm-hmm. if they have all the same skill sets. So... It's very worth your time and energy to start putting your 
your thoughts out there as it relates to Bitcoin. Stop, t- stop keeping it all in your head. Just let it out. Yeah, that was well said. And I agree like wholeheartedly. That's why I started creating content too. It's like, I need some way to see if I actually know what I'm talking about and making the content yourself really solidifies that when you sit down and try to write and explain out what you heard on the Michael Saylor series with Robert Breedlove, like just listening to it doesn't allow it to click, but you writing it down really does. And I think a fear most people have is they're going to go and post something online and it might not be hundred percent accurate and they're going to get railed in the comments called an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. That literally never happens. I had the same fear. I would like post something. I'm like, I don't know if this is entirely true, but I'm just going to send it. Mm. And I don't know. I hardly ever receive negative feedback, even as my account has grown to like a decent size. You know, you, it won't be negative per se, but there will, people will check you, which is a good thing. That means you're learning. Mm. So it's funny, like some of the simplest topics that like in my head, I thought I really understood. But once you start writing it down on paper, it's a little harder to explain. Once you start putting those type of posts out and you have people correcting you, not like you said, not in a negative way, but it's just like, I think you have this part wrong. That's, that's how the real learning process happens. Yeah. A thousand percent. Cause it, and if you didn't put that out, you would never get corrected and you would still have the wrong understanding in your head. Yeah, exactly. For years and years. Yeah. Shifting gears a little bit more towards jobs overall. Uh, mm. I've been, I was scrolling through your Twitter feed and I saw some stuff about AI and you know, which jobs it's going to automate. How are you thinking about that going forward? Or should, you know, an 18, 19 year old today really try to hone in on blue collar skills? Or do you think there's still a a ripe future if you want to work and uh, do something white collar? I think if you want to go into white collar type of work, you need to learn how to use the AI. So I don't think it's going to replace you per se, but if you don't know how to prompt it or use it to your advantage, uh, your peers will be able to do that and will outperform you really quickly. So I'd say learn it. There's tons of courses out there now, even though it's still relatively so new. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just starting to take one right now. Yeah, you just, just learn it. Because um, if you don't, other people are going to take your job or you're b- probably better off doing a blue collar job then. Um, but yeah, as, as AI relates to myself too, I saw a couple months back that there's this recruiting software that is completely AI based. So what we do as recruiters, right? We go out into the market. We go and find people for specific jobs. We go and kind of pitch them the jobs, if you will. And I saw the software come out. So instead of me doing the outbound, whether that be on LinkedIn, email, whatever it may be, uh, the AI software does it for you. And it can mm-hmm. kind of like customize the messaging, seem like it seem like it's coming from a real person. And at the time I saw that, I was really discouraged, to be honest. I was like, Jeez, man, like my entire job is about to be automated in, in a flip of a switch. I haven't really seen it used in mass yet, but I do know of other like larger recruiting firms working in other industries starting to implement this stuff. So it's coming uh, if it's not already here. And it's a matter of learning how to use it now so you don't get left behind. Um, yeah. And across the board, other white collar jobs, I think it's a very similar situation. I agree. Do you sort of subscribe to like the Jeff Booth type idea that this stuff's going to be good, right? AI is going to make society more productive. It's going to drive prices down. So even if people become unemployed because their job got automated, they'll actually be better off net because everything Mm -hmm. becomes so much cheaper. Yeah. I think through different technical, technological revolutions, you've seen the same kind of argument emerge. And I think there will always be something new for humans to do. This one's mm-hmm. kind of odd, though, because it's the first, like, knowledge-based work that's getting yeah. taken over. So we'll see. But I'm still optimistic. I'm hopeful that humans will... There will always be a, a place for humans. And I'm just thinking about recruiting, too. Back to that same example. It's like, okay, the, the AI can go and do the outbound messaging, but the AI can't hop on a phone call, at least yet, and, and talk to people human to human. There's still a mm-hmm. human factor to a lot of work um, that AI is not going to be, be able to fill for a, a long time. So yeah. I, I wouldn't get two in the weeds about AI. I would just keep doing what you're doing, making sure you're learning it though. Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, as a, from the consumer side of the equation, I would never want to talk to a robot on the phone. I, I hate doing it now, even if it got better at it and it wasn't like so robotic, I still would rather talk to a human. Dude, I call myself, this is probably like five years ago or so I was calling my, my phone company and I got, 
but sent to a, basically an automated message. I didn't realize at the time it was automated. Automated, and after like three or four minutes of talking to the person, I realized it was a AI chatbot. I wasn't actually <laughs> talking to a person. And at that moment, I was like, "Huh, this is about to get really weird." So, as I, I'd say, as more AI gets more lifelike, more human-like, we can't tell the difference between the two. That's when you need to start watching out more. Yeah, definitely. Juxtaposing that conversation with AI. How do you think about the rise of remote work since COVID happened? Yeah, so what we're seeing right now, and not even just the Bitcoin industry, this is just across the board. Um, since COVID, everyone started remote jobs or that got a lot more popular. A lot of people are refusing to go back in the office. And people want flexible part-time work. So that's actually a service we created through Bitcoin Talent Co. Uh, we released it just like two months ago or so. But the idea is rather than hiring... 10 full-time people what if you can hire 15 part-time people and you don't have to take on the the added uh the added cost of let's just say the benefits included um health yada yada you can just hire this person for a set duration on a set hourly fee an hourly rate and you can use them as you need um and that's that's what companies are looking for that's also what workers are looking for i think workers want more flexibility in their lives they want to stay remote um it, it, it just gives you so much flexibility in life. Uh, I've been living that life personally the last year or so, working 100% remote. And it's been great. So mm -hmm. I think, yeah, the, both sides of the equation, the companies and, and the workers themselves want more part-time remote type of work. Yeah, that makes sense. Although I may, I guess you're more in the weeds, but I feel like I'd kind of push back. I don't know how many people want part-time. They definitely want the flexibility of remote I guess it just all depends on, you know, how drastic the economic situation gets, whether people Yeah, the, the idea is instead of working for one company, let's be real. If you're working for one company 40 hours per week, you're only probably being productive, I'd say, for half, three quarters of that time. And the, and the other quarter is wasted. But what if you're doing part-time remote work for three companies, right? Mm -hmm. So you're being productive across the board and you're probably earning more too because you could charge an, a higher hourly rate. Um mm -hmm if you're not getting all those added and benefits included in like a full-time role. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's a good point. And it brings us back to the first thing we really talked about, which was like job hoppers. You're kind of doing that, but it's like, all right, I got this one part-time job and you can use that as leverage to basically get a different one for higher pay. And you still have both. I, I see a lot of people doing it right now in real time, to be honest, they're taking on two, three roles at a time. Yeah. Do you, th I've heard the same thing as like, there's the, uh, like the quiet quitters or people who like they get these like three or four different remote jobs, like full time and they're doing them all the time. What are your thoughts on that? And the, the, is that the just like a ZERP between, thing? Difference between what I just said and quiet quitters is the part-time worker, workers that I was talking about actually want to be productive. Yeah. <laughs> they want to grow their career. Uh, quiet quitters are just basically trying to do, I'd say people around our age that are just trying to do the very minimum to get by and collect a paycheck. They're much better off in the, in the nine to five, just, try to stay in, in the corporate ecosystem and lay low for as long as they can, get the minimum amount of work done. But yeah, yeah I'm not a big fan of those. I think, I think life is wasted in that aspect. I think we humans um, get a lot of our value and, and self-worth from our work, right? So if you're slacking off during eight hours a day for work, trying to do the very minimum, that's how you're going to feel inside too. And that'll translate mm -hmm. to other areas of life. So if anyone's doing that right now, I really encourage you not to. I was kind of that way in my engineering job. Not fully, but I wasn't I wasn't trying to go above and beyond as much as I could just because I realized that the rewards weren't there. Um, but it, it did make me unhappy. So once I came over the, the Bitcoin space and I'm working full days every day and not checking the clock, I feel much more fulfilled. Uh, yes, it's don't yeah. don't try the, the quiet quitting. I just put put work in proof of work. Yeah, I agree. Humans need to work. Even you know, three or four years ago, I was still working like restaurant jobs. I was in college, but I always noticed like sometimes during a shift, I would slack off, be checking my phone, look at the clock, whatever, ready to go home. But I would be much more fulfilled, have a much better shift if I just like put a hundred percent effort into mopping that floor or busting those tables. It really, it's just, I don't know. It's something about human nature. You have to work hard. 
Yeah, you know what? People are gonna still do this quiet quitting thing. It's it's not gonna go away, but that just tells me that the competition is less and I have more of an opportunity to outport, outperform them um, if I actually take my job seriously. So you can use it as a way to be pessimistic or optimistic. I'm gonna choose the optimistic route. Yeah, that's a good idea. On a sort of side of related note, did you see that TikTok that went viral last week with the girl crying basically about her job and like it was like nine to five, I hate this, I can't afford to live in the city. What were your thoughts on that video? I'm not on TikTok, but I did see it uh, as I was scrolling Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, my thoughts are going back to like the fourth turning idea where easy times create weak men and women. I think we're at that phase right now and people like coming into the, the workplace now don't appreciate the value of hard work. They think things should be given to them, which I don't really, I don't really think they, they were brought up in, in this system, right? Where everything was kind of given to them. And especially now with smartphones, they, they could have instant dopamine whenever they want. So they weren't really trained in an environment where hard work was valued and rewarded. Mm -hmm. Now it's just kind of, we also know that if you, if you get fired or sorry, you get laid off, you can also receive government handouts. Um, so that there's backstops there too. Uh, yeah. So I think it's, I think a largely due to the system and current culture, but there's going to be a catalyst in which things flip and we're going to go back to hard times and people are going to have to realize that they don't have a choice between, um, hard work or not. They're going to have to do hard work. Yeah, I agree. I think the, the hard times are definitely coming. Maybe Bitcoin can hasten the growth period to get us out of those hard times about that video. I do. I agree with like the sentiment that, you know, she shouldn't be like posting videos of her crying because she has to work. But also I do think there's an element of like, she grew up in this culture that's telling women they have to go and do this nine to five job. And like, there's no other alternative. You have to go to college and take out debt. And part of it is just like a byproduct of the things that were pushed on her growing yeah. up or anybody like her. But at the end of the day, humans need to take personal responsibility, right? If 100%. you're the one who took out the loan to go to school to study nothing, and you're the one who works a job that you hate, you got to take actionable steps to get out of that situation. I got a question for you being a young male. Do you find girls attractive if they want to go and have a career? Or would you rather them be like, I just want to be a stay at home mom? <laughs> for me personally, definitely the second part is much more attractive. Yeah. It, but also you don't want a girl with like zero ambition. So there's a certain balance. It, it depends on like what type of career they're pursuing. I would say, mm -hmm. um, if they're just, if they're really struck on like climbing the corporate ladder, I don't think that's very attractive. I think that, and that would probably detract from the relationship they could have as a mother or wife. Yeah. I, I just think about it often. I see it in my, in my own life with, with friends. I'm just curious to hear from someone else, someone else's perspective. Uh, about women yeah. and and their them in the workforce yeah i mean if they want to do that they want to do that. but i think and statistics show that most women would rather not have to work so that's yeah. my goal as a man is to make enough enough bread enough bitcoin to make that an option same here man i'm talking about jobs when i get up for my job every day that's like my why why am i doing this it's it's so i can provide for my family and so i can put, push bitcoin forward but first and foremost mm -hmm. is provide for my family yeah, agree. And this actually uh, brings us to the next point very uh, cleanly is a tweet you sent out the other day. I'm going to read it word for word. Bitcoin doesn't make you rich. A loving family and good health does. I constantly remind myself that as I go through my daily priorities. So yeah, why don't you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Like I said before, I got into to Bitcoin around 2017. That was near the highs. And then so I've seen almost two full, full markets uh, from bear to bull. Um, going to 2020 to 2021, I kind of knew it was going to happen. I knew the price was going to run up and I constantly, f I, I felt myself not living in the moment. I was always looking to the future. When's the price of Bitcoin going to go up? What is this going to do for me? How is it going to help me financially? How is this going to help my family? But I forgot to stop and smell the roses, which I think I got better at this bear market, which means, okay, if Bitcoin's a, five, 10, 15, 20 year investment, I sh shouldn't really care that much about price action. Um, and I should focus more on, on my family and, and friends and cultivating my life and living the life I want to live. So if you're looking, if you're planning too much in the future, looking towards the future, 
and, and not, not remembering to look around where you're at right now at this moment, you're going to forget and you're going to let that time go by. And before you know it, years and years will go by. And okay, so you have, you have 10, 20, 30 Bitcoin. Uh, you have plenty of savings, retirement, great. But do you have a family that loves you? Um, so that's, yeah, that's where that spawned from and I'm trying to be more conscious of it now. Yeah, that's really well said. I think it's something that Bitcoiners probably struggle with more than the average person because we can get hung up on this idea of time preference. You got to keep a low time preference, always thinking for the future, but there's certainly a balance there. You can't only think for the future because life exists in the present. You have to be yeah. present in this moment. That honestly, that shifted my way. I thought about Bitcoin too. I mean, I was more of a, I don't, I don't like to call myself a maximalist, but I was more of a hardcore maxi in the sense of, I was like, I'm never selling my Bitcoin. Never. Like I'm holding on it for, for decades and decades. You, you have to pry it from me to get it. I changed my mind recently on that. It's yes, I'm going to hold most of it. Don't get me wrong, but I'm going to spend a little bit too. When, when the time's right, if it's to buy a house for my, my future family, um, if it's for, for, I don't know. Yeah. Things that are, that are really like elevate me and my family's life overall. I'm okay spending mm-hmm. some sats on it. And I, I think that's been demonized a lot up to this point. It's okay to spend some sats in my opinion for a better life in the, in the present. Yeah, I agree. And I love the way you're saying it. You're saying spending sats, not selling them, because I'm sure you and I are on the same page here. We're not going to sell our Bitcoin to just hold dollars in a bank account and let it sit there and quote unquote de-risk. If we're getting rid of any of our Bitcoin, it's to actually get a gooder service that makes your life better. Right. There's something I want at that moment that would make my quality of life much better. Yeah. And the cool part is like USD is not in that exchange at all. So it doesn't really have any net effect on the Bitcoin price necessarily. If, if you think about it, maybe, sure. maybe I'm wrong in that regard. But, hey, if uh, yeah, we're talking, I, could, I don't know if we're doing this 20 years in the future, maybe it will, maybe it could affect price if we're that much of back holders by then. Oh no, yeah, maybe. Uh, hopefully that, I don't know. Well, I say hopefully the dollar's not around in 20 years, but also hopefully, you know, maybe the, the decay of fiat takes a long time because I think the faster that happens, the more chaotic society will get. Yeah. You don't want it to happen too quickly. Mm-hmm. You So I don't know if this is public. We can cut this out as if it's not, but uh, you live in Montana, right? Right now I'm in Boise, Idaho. Okay, Idaho, yeah. So was there a, a strategy there getting out to the most r- rural part of the country? Yeah, so a year ago I got engaged, and the whole idea for me and my fiance and our dog was to go out west, go explore. So we've been in three different locations so far. Salt Lake City was the first one. We went up to Kalispell, Montana, and now we're in Boise, Idaho. And yeah, it's, we go snowboarding, we go hiking. I just went mountain biking yesterday. We're doing all different uh, outdoorsy types of things, just exploring before we finally settle down and have a family. Um, the coolest part about it is I every new place I go, there's always Bitcoiners there. Like in Salt Lake City, there was a huge Bitcoin meetup. So I'd go there once a month, get to meet so many new people, Plus in Montana, surprisingly, there were like probably a good five to 10 Bitcoiners within 50 miles of me. Um, so that was pretty cool. Got to meet up with some of them. Same thing here in Boise. It's There's a huge meetup, which is great because it's like anywhere I go, at least in the United States, I'm going to have some kind of friends. <laughs> it's really yeah. nice for traveling. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I'm surprised you were able to gather. You said uh, ten or fifteen in Montana. Like I'm yeah, kind of surprised. Yeah. There was the way Montana works is like 200 miles is considered like a short drive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's yeah. why I give like a 50 mile radius, still considered uh, nearby. But yeah, there's probably like five to ten people that are like hardcore yeah. bitcoiners. I'm sure you could probably fly on those Montana roads. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I would consider 50 miles close here. So that's that's easy uh, trip for a meetup to go hang out with some Bitcoiners. I was talking yeah. to my brother about this too. It does make traveling a lot easier. He wants to go on like a surf trip or whatever. And I'm like, dude, if we're going to go somewhere, we're going to El Salvador because I'll actually be able to connect us with Bitcoin people. We won't just like be there by ourselves. Like That'd be struggling. Great. You could pay for surf lessons with Bitcoin, I bet. Yeah, exactly. And when we were in Pacific Bitcoin, obviously we're there for a Bitcoin meetup, but... I feel like the same idea applies. You just, you're in a new city, you get on the Orange Pill app or you, you send out a tweet. It's another advantage of having a, a decent sized Twitter following is you could tweet, I'm in such and such city, who's here, who wants to link up? Oh yeah, I've done that plenty of times. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. 
-hmm. With that, we could start to to wrap up here. And my last question, and I ask this to everyone, what does Bitcoin mean to you? Oh, man. Um, I don't want to give like a generic answer like Bitcoin's hope or whatever. That's, um, that's exactly what Peter Dunworth said this morning. Yeah. <laughs> everyone says that, copying uh, Michael Saylor. Let me just think for a sec. I think Bitcoin's opportunity. And I say that because I'm in my my job right now is to follow the market in terms of how many new companies are, are being created, how much funding are they getting, how many people are switching their careers from fiat over to Bitcoin. And all I see is, uh, if you if you were to chart this all, is up and to the right, meaning that the opportunities are growing more day by day, and even in this bear market. Um, so what that tells me is that if you're looking to start a new career, if you're tired of working in your fiat job, working in Bitcoin gives you, there's so much potential to do really anything you want because the space is so new, yet it's, it's emerged, uh, it's matured enough now that it can support a whole workforce under it. Um, and there's nothing like working like with, with like-minded people and f pushing something forward that gives you purpose in life like pushing forward something that's much greater than yourself makes you feel so much better inside and fulfilled it's hard to explain that feeling um so yeah i think overall bitcoin's opportunity yeah that was well said i i definitely concur working on something that's bigger than yourself it does, whether it's bitcoin or not it's it's very important and it helps you know give meaning and, and satisfaction eric i really appreciate you coming on where can we send the audience to find you and find bitcoin talent co yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, my Twitter is at epodrules, E-P-O-D-R-U-L-Z. And you can learn more about Bitcoin Talent Co. We have a general application. So if you're a job seeker, you can submit your information there if you want to be considered for any of our upcoming jobs. Or if you're a Bitcoin company, uh, you need help with uh, scaling your team, whether it be a one-off role or multiple roles. Um, we even do like some advisory type of roles too. So you need like a fractional CFO. You can head over to our website, get in touch with us. That's www.bitcointalent.co. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mitch.